Agency is definitely a cognitive concept, as we understand in cognitive sciences, agency is very, very important. But that idea itself is seen in the body-mind continuum. And uh, the self is a concept which has transcendental elements, and uh, it also gives you a sense of purpose. The Rational View is a weekly series hosted by me, Dr. Alan Scott, providing a rational, evidence-based perspective on important societal issues. Produced by Soapbox Media. Hello, and welcome to another episode of The Rational View. I'm your host, Dr. Al Scott. In this, my 100th episode, I continue to explore consciousness, but I'm stepping a bit out of my comfort zone a little and seeing what I can learn from the religious viewpoint on consciousness. The idea of an eternal soul is central to many religions, and Hinduism especially uh, has a belief in reincarnation. I want to learn what Hindus think about what the soul entails and what are the parallels between religious thought, philosophy, and the findings of neurobiology. If you enjoy what you're hearing, please hit like on your podcast app, uh, share it with your friends. I'd love to hear from you on my Facebook group at The Rational View. Sangeetha Menon is professor and head of the Consciousness Studies Program and the Dean of the School of Humanities at National Institute of Advanced Studies in Bangalore. There, she developed the NIAS Consciousness Studies Program along with B.V. Srikantan to study consciousness with an interdisciplinary and a multidisciplinary mandate. Her major area of research is philosophy of psychology. She holds degrees in biology and philosophy. One of her primary contributions in consciousness studies is in presenting and engaging with the concept and experience of self from the neurobiological and philosophical points of view. She was awarded the Gita Puraskaram in 1998 for research studies on the Bhagavad Gita. She's also an honorary fellow at the University of Exeter, UK. She currently heads the NIAS Consciousness Studies Program and is the Professor and Dean of the School of Humanities at NIAS. Sangeeta, welcome to The Rational View. I'm looking forward to discussing uh, these topics with you, which I have very little knowledge, I must admit. <laughs> There's so much I want to ask of you. Could you please tell us about yourself and, and how you got to be uh, in this position of having degrees in both biology and philosophy and, and head of this, this school? Yeah. Uh, thank you, Dr. Scott, uh, for this uh, invitation. It's a great pleasure uh, to talk to you. And uh, thank you for having me uh, at your show. Uh, and thank you for that kind introduction. <laughs> uh, well, uh, I think my core interest was biology from uh, you know my early college days itself. And I particularly uh, liked the Darwinian theory of evolution and uh, how the mind shaped up to be what it is today. So, so I think my love for Darwin and his theories perhaps took me to certain questions which are on the periphery. And uh, it's also possible that Darwin himself must have left those questions unanswered for me and many others like me who would have asked the similar questions, which is uh, relating to evolution and evolution of mind, evolution of human life, and primarily the uh, meaning of human purpose. And I know that once we ask the question about human purpose, uh, it goes a bit beyond the Darwinian framework, though in biology too, we talk about purpose. So I guess at that point, I, uh, uh, due to a few acquaintances, I came to philosophy and uh, started uh, looking at philosophy as my source to understand some of these deeper questions and perhaps to appreciate life in a few more nuances outside the evolutionary framework as well, which might, uh, which would give uh, some of the vantage points outside the deterministic view of human life, I guess. Uh, so uh, to, on one side, I would say biology gives you a very structured view and very grounded view of things. 
And on the other side, I think philosophy equip, equips you with uh, imaginative power, and which I think uh, as a biologist, you need imagination. And as a philosopher, I think you need structures of thinking. So both are very complementary. It seems like uh, you're saying that uh, the study of philosophy adds a, a level of uh, meaning to the investigation of biology. So biology is the how we got here, and philosophy is the why are we here. Is that yeah, a I, fair I guess assessment? Quite, uh, quite well put. Uh, biology perhaps uh, would give, I think, responses to why we are as well as or how we are as well, but philosophy gives you that extra vantage point. And I think in that sense, philosophy uh, is very important. It, it allows you a space where you can ask certain questions without being scared of uh, having to fit within a particular framework or theoretical framework. Yeah. I see. So you've done a lot of work on consciousness, which is what I'm trying to explore right now in my podcast. Um, what do you see as the hard problem of consciousness? Well, uh, that's a very interesting question. And I think uh, we may take uh, a little bit of uh, the understanding of this question itself to come up uh, to perhaps respond to that question. As you know, this hard problem of consciousness itself is an expression which goes to uh, another scholar in consciousness studies, Dave Chalmers, an Australian mathematician uh, philosopher. And it goes back to uh, the Scientific American article, which was published in the 90s, and uh, where he describes about uh, the hard problem of consciousness. And it caught wildfire, and many people wrote many, several papers, several books after that after that publication of the Scientific American paper. And in that uh, research article, uh, uh, Dave Chalmers talks about uh, the fundamental riddle in consciousness. And this riddle is the coexistence of the easy problems and the hard problem. And he explains further what is the easy problem and uh, easy problems in pure, plural and what is the hard problem in singular. So the easy problems are perhaps how our visual mechanism works in order to give us visual perceptions or how the sense perceptions happen. So basically, uh, how do we understand the experience? How do I feel? And uh, how do I get such a neat experience of seeing something or listening to something or touching something and so on? And uh, this we believe we can understand perhaps with the development uh, in uh, medicine, equipment, scanning technologies, and so on. And uh, though it is very, very minimal that we know, even if we take something about something like visual perception, uh, the suggestion made was that with advancements in medical technologies, we may be able to understand uh, perception, sense perception in a much more detailed manner, perhaps many years later. But he said that uh, even if you have solutions, answers for the easy problem, there is something of the hard problem of consciousness. He described that as uh, how does uh, different quantitative, uh, physical, uh, neural processes, which are discrete, which are lying scattered everywhere, they combine together and give rise to a solitary, or a, if you put it, a unitary, subjective, qualitative feeling of I am seeing something or I'm experiencing it. So where does this experience part of it come from? It seems to be very qualitative, unlike the discrete neural processes. So how does all these neural processes, electrochemical processes, uh, combined together to give a seamless experience is called as the hard problem. But then I would add to it that uh, I also have published my paper on this, that the hard problem is really about the harder problem, which is not just about the experience, but 
the i who is experiencing it so it is not the experience comes with a big big question mark namely i so who is that i so it is not that i just uh, it is not just that the experience comes the experience comes with its beholder which is the i so the i is uh, to me the harder problem of consciousness how do we understand that self and <laughs> the you and i who perhaps at this point having a conversation Yes, and how, why are we differentiated from each other? Why do I experience sensations from my eyes and you experience sensations from your eyes? And they're ind independent uh, experiences. What, what, what defines the edges of experience? And if we're, we're bringing in together all these diverse sensations, the, the typical interpretation is that we have a brain that brings all of these things together with a with a set of neurons uh, and this is the complete self we have a processing computer that exists in our head that provides some sort of a uh, a unified experience can you tell me what what do we know what have we learned about consciousness from neurobiology that we can apply to this hard problem yeah. So, uh, as you might know, Dr. Scott, uh, that uh, neuroscience is one of the forerunner in disciplines, uh, understanding consciousness. And this is because particularly the, uh, not really assumption, if I, even if I say assumption, people may not like it because uh, uh, there's a lot of evidence from neuroscience, at least the claim is that, that brain is the seat of consciousness. So basically, if you have to talk about consciousness, we talk about the origin of consciousness, and that is the brain. So, so assuming that the brain is the origin of consciousness, all the discussions on consciousness is centered on the brain and understanding the brain. And uh, this is also very interesting that uh, on one side, we see uh, the brain as a very boring organ, you know, very rational uh, argumentative organ, uh, I mean, considering from the biological point of view. And uh, this is why even something called as uh, medical documentation uh, is more about a clinical description of someone's disposition, neural disposition, talent, and so on. And uh, this changed over a period of time. And there is something on the medical narrative as a storyteller. So your brain, however challenged or however productive it is, there's a narrative which is surrounding me. So which means I'm the storyteller. And uh, I'm the storyteller of my experience, what I see. And uh, so there is a narrative which is built. So this very interesting subjective point of view is very hard to uh, crack from a very strict neurobiological point of view, because neurobiology doesn't deal with I, the subject, or qualitative, or story, and so on. But it's very interesting that a lot of uh, neurobiologists, neuropsychiatrists, philosophers, came together to have a theoretical framework of what we call as the subject of consciousness. And that is why uh, they uh, there happened a connection between the study of uh, the first-person data, which we get from the brain or the neural data, uh, which can be related to the first-person experiences. So what I mean to say is uh, the development of brain scanning technologies, fMRI and so on and so forth, uh, was assumed to be helping in understanding the inner states of consciousness or as the experiences of the I. So the, the contribution of uh, neuroscience, neurobiology uh, in general to consciousness studies is uh, bending a bit for the slightly philosophical frameworks and uh, allowing its own theoretical frameworks to accommodate the first person data and developing brain scanning technologies. I think that's, mm -hmm. that's the contribution. Yeah, as you say, uh, the functional magnetic resonance imaging of the brain, <clears throat> can when you tell somebody to imagine 
doing something, the, the functional magnetic resonance imaging can show a activity in a particular portion of the brain that correlates with this internal imagination. So that that's a very interesting thing that, that supports, I think, the, the association of the brain with consciousness to a certain degree. Can you tell me about uh, Hindu ideas of, of agency and consciousness and self, perhaps from, from the Bhagavad Gita? Thank you for asking that question. And uh, I also wanted to say one or two uh, perhaps descriptions of what is Hindu philosophy. In a sense, Hindu philosophy is also Indian philosophy because of its ancestry, the historicity, and also the textual tradition, which goes back to many, many centuries of years. So uh, to avoid any kind of political ideologies coming in, <laughs> uh, perhaps we can also say an Indian point of view, and here in the Indian, Indian philosophical point of view, because the Bhagavad Gita is the foundational text of Indian philosophy. As students, we learn that, as undergrads, we learn, and in our masters, we do that. And uh, so it's not only about a practice or a, 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 someone who is living Hinduism uh, in his or her daily life, but also as someone who is interested in Indian philosophy as a whole, I think the text Bhagavad Gita is important. And that is why you, you might also know that there were several physicists who int were interested in, in, from the uh, from the West, the larger West of uh, the globe. So, but to come back to your question, I just wanted to give this introduction to that text because it is a text which is uh, uh, which uh, accommodates not just one religion, but I think multiple religions because of its philosophical uh, approach than just a religious uh, text. So, so the in the religion, of course as Bhagavad Gita is one of its major texts. But I think more than that, Indian philosophy as its foundation uh, in a uh, couple of texts, and one of that text is uh, Bhagavad Gita, which again is part of an epic called the Mahabharata, which is uh, all about human relationships and the study of emotions, etc., etc. So it's part of the epic Mahabharata, the Indian epic called Mahabharata, which you must, have, be, must be aware of. So the idea of self and agency in the Gita, I'm entering to your specific question, uh, the, the text Gita is a very complex text. It is basically uh, contextualized uh, on a battlefield, and it is a conversation which uh, goes on between someone who is very smart uh, as he lived his life, Arjuna, and... Uh, the conversation with someone who happened to be a charioteer at that point, but the charioteer is no charioteer, just a charioteer, but uh, someone who supposedly to have uh, uh, very non-human characteristics also, but at the same time being a very smart person as well. So it's basically between two smart people, but then one with a transhuman capabilities and the other being a human in a perfect sense with uh, with his uh, challenges and frailties. As I said, this text itself is very, very, very complex. And uh, the idea of agency is seen in the context of the body, mind, spirit continuum. So agency is definitely a cognitive concept. As we understand in cognitive sciences, agency is very, very important. Uh, but that idea itself is seen in the body-mind continuum. And uh, the self is a concept which has transcendental elements when the point of view of the Gita. And uh, it also gives you a sense of purpose and uh, a metaphysical travel towards it. So as per the Gita theory, perhaps its cognitive uh, theoretical framework, Agency is something which is uh, based on your interest, your intent, using mental faculties, physical faculties, faculties of desire, uh, ability to make decisions, ability to reflect, and all that will give rise to 
an agenthood uh, which is the honor of that action as well, the honor, the enjoyer, and the experiencer. So basically, the agent is an enjoyer and honor of a particular experience. This is important because the agent is seen not as the ultimate possessor of the self. In fact, uh, it is described that the self with the capital S is untouched by the agency and the enjoyership of the human action, of the individual action. But the agency itself takes its power to intent to direct its consciousness from the S with the capital, uh, the self with the capital S. So agency in that sense is subservient to larger self consciousness. And uh, uh, agency is basically uh, caused by uh, certain tendencies which you might have brought into this lifetime from the previous lifetime. And that is how our personality is different. And there are as many agents, as many personalities. So this is something uh, quite uh, interesting. So you mentioned uh, that agency can come from tendencies one may even get from a previous life. That's a very interesting uh, point of view, very, um, I think, Hindu soul type uh, things. And I, I've, I'd like to explore what the soul means. And, and I think this is a very good hint towards what the belief in the soul entails. The, the soul is associated with agencies and tendencies, but is not necessarily the capital S self. Is that a fair assessment of what the soul entails in this yeah so uh, there are certain corresponding sanskrit words uh, in the gita text itself for example uh, the sanskrit word which directs to the experiencing enjoying self is called as jiva jiva uh, if we write in english trans trans uh, transliterate j i v a uh, so jiva is the one who is uh, intenting, acting out an action, uh, desiring before that, desiring something and then acting out an action. And uh, the way a, a self, that little self, the experiential self, which is the jiva, responds to the situation and how is the challenge understood in life depends upon the previous life karma. Karma is action. So you come with the actions from the previous life and those actions, the, the, the minute particles of those actions, maybe it is affixing as in some way to the current life, which is uh, in Sanskrit called as vasana. Uh, so this would direct us in the way we would respond and to relate to a particular life moment. But then the jiva or the little self is no way the larger self, which is not born, which is unborn, and which doesn't have death, which doesn't have birth. And so this is very, very important according to the Gita, which is that the true self, which it is absolutely unborn and it doesn't have death. And so that is the true self. And, uh, uh, but then the jiva is influenced by the propensities or what is called as the vasana of the previous life, how you lived your life in the earlier life. So those perhaps act as some subtle traits, uh, uh, you know, or the subtle causes of your personality traits and make you behave or make you respond or make you understand in a certain manner. So the whole idea is that this little self perhaps what you described as the soul, uh, which is now in, in housed by this body and the mind in the current life, if it practices principles of discrimination, dis discrimination in the sense to distinguish between what is true and untrue, what is real and unreal, what is permanent and impermanent, and practices detachment at the same time engaging with your uh, life, Perhaps we get into a state of mind where it is understood that your true nature is not 
your true nature is not your agentive, emotive uh, self, but the S self with the capital S, which is consciousness. So this distinction, the metaphysical distinction is very important to understand even the ethical and the cognitive aspects of the little self with the S uh, in lower case, which is the experiential self uh, who is interacting in this life world. Okay, so there are several different selves in this that, that are interesting to tease apart. Um, which self has the memories? Is there a particular self? Like I, I see self as consisting of tendencies and memories, and these are maybe separate processes in a mind um, or in a in a in a in a being. How how is that uh, understood? In, in this thinking? Yeah, so I think this idea of memory is very, very important. And there are several texts which talk about memory. And uh, it's, in fact, a very important concept in many of the Indian uh, philosophical disciplines, uh, philosophies as a whole. Uh, according to the Gita, there is something called as uh, the mental organ, which is... Uh, uh, which is slightly different from the, you know, Cartesian or the Western take on uh, your intellectual or cognitive organ. So memory is uh, uh, smriti. Uh, in Sanskrit, it's called as smriti. is uh, very important cognitively, but at the same time, it is an impediment in your travel to the transcendental understanding of your true self. But then the memory is also part of the little self, uh, which I uh, mentioned as the jiva, because it the jiva uses the memory uh, to or uses and collects memory in order to relate with uh, the current life and living world. And so, what happens in reincarnation uh, is. Are the smriti lost and you just have um, what parts of self uh, are continuous between two different lives uh, in this in this idea? Yeah, I think that's an interesting question. Um, so as I said earlier, there's this very interesting idea called vasana. And uh, basically, vasana are the essential, uh, what should I say, the, the essence of perhaps the memories of the previous life. How you have lived your life in the, your previous life uh, is transferred to your current life in the form of vasanas. And uh, the vasana, which is in a very subtle manner, invoke, provoke, and express your mental actions, your intentions and desires. So memory is, uh, uh, is very important in the sense uh, that it definitely influences your current life because you have, you have carried your memory in the form of vasanas, which are propensities, which are waiting to be blooming when it gets uh, approximate or when it gets a conducive environment. So one can say that the vasana is also a carrier of the memories in a subtle manner, maybe not about the memory of day-to-day -day activities, but memories of uh, perhaps that little self which lived its past life and the repositories of the actions, desires, intentions, and so on. So uh, let me also uh, tell, uh, say that uh, Indo philosophy, and in particular in Bhagavad Gita, believes in reincarnation. So reincarnation is something which is believed, and uh, though, so that is why there are a lot of references where how you live should be very important so that you get a better life, uh, perhaps in the next birth. So your food is very important. Uh, the way you think is very important. The way you relate with your mind is very important. So reincarnation is something which is accepted and talked about and discussed uh, to some uh, certain extent in the Gita. And uh, it's also said that we don't know in which form you will reincarnate, not necessarily a human form. That also is important. It again depends upon 
uh, in uh, where where you fall in your next birth, you know your uh, your life form. Where does it fall? Which receptacle it forms? It cannot be. It cannot be. It need not be just the human form. So that is why every life is important. So that you collect uh, certain good karma in order to be perhaps born in a better receptacle in your subsequent birth. So so reincarnation is important. But then what is important is the cycle of reincarnation is unending, according to the Gita. You, you, you are born, you die, you are born, you die, you die. You So that cycle is unending. And this cycle itself is the cause of pain, existential pain and metaphysical pain. So the only way to get out of this non-ending cycle, the loop, is to understand the true nature of yourself, that you are not the jiva, you are not this little self who is, uh, you know, bound by the, the, the expressions of the vasana or the essence of how you lived in the previous life, but to understand that you are a non-agent, you are a non-enjoyer, but you are consciousness, which is uncaused, but causing everything else. So there are very interesting statements in the Gita for some of these chapters say that everything else exists in uh, consciousness, but uh, consciousness doesn't exist in the other, which means consciousness is never reduced to something smaller or the little self, but then the little self takes the consciousness, a part of the consciousness to reflect, uh, to illumine by itself. So. The, the little self definitely is cost, but the larger self, which is consciousness, is not cost. So consciousness with the C capital is uncaused, according to the Gita. But the personal consciousness, or the consciousness of an agent, is definitely cost. Interesting. So when I hear this, I, 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 I try to make parallels to what I understand of consciousness studies, and it seems to be almost a, a panpsychism that's being discussed here, that everything is conscious and there is agency or will, which is the small jiva, which uh, maybe resides on top of that and is associated with a body and a, and a, and a brain. Um, but in this philosophy, everything is conscious. It's not just people. It's You could be animals. You could be reincarnated as, as quote-unquote lower um, beings. Is, is everything conscious or is it just living things that are have consciousness or, or in this philosophy, it, is the universe Yeah, well, it's very clear. Everything is conscious. The, it's not necessary you have to have a life in the sense of biological life. For example, a, a stone is, is consciousness. So, I mean, let us not even talk about the other species, non-human species, but everything is in consciousness or as the potential of the large consciousness C with the capital. But it's just that it's form and name and perhaps its functions as that particular entity doesn't allow it to express it in that many manners. So, as that, so that is why, again, you go back to reincarnation. It depends upon the body you get, the mind you get, in order to have the capacity to express. So if you are if you are a stone, you express stone consciousness. If you are a human, you have human consciousness. But that doesn't mean that uh, any of this is lesser from a metaphysical point of view. So metaphysically, everything is in consciousness with the capital C, and everything is consciousness as well. So yeah, so I mean, you can bring in panpsychism to a certain extent, but I think what is important here also. There is a plurality which is recognized as that everything is consciousness, everything is in consciousness, but the plurality is also to be understood in a certain sense of non-dualism, that uh, the multiple things which are existing are not different from each other from a metaphysical point of view. Interesting. We are all one in the force. <laughs> <laughs> so, so there is some sort of shared aspect of this uh, universal consciousness that everything is one yes. in, in this thinking. Interesting. 
I, I want to go back to um, a little bit about the reincarnation because it, it's, it, it interests me. And um, you mentioned that karma uh, affects the station of one's reincarnation and past actions uh, in, in the Indian philosophy uh, influence where you become what vessel you become reincarnated in or and there's a hierarchy here does this philosophy reinforce human hierarchy and hierarchical uh classism in india um, did you uh, can you repeat that question one more time i wanted to know in what sense you meant the hierarchy yeah you use the word hierarchy really so Human hierarchies and classism uh, are are something that's been around for a long time. Is this uh, does this philosophy reinforce uh, classism? And in other words, having different classes of existence, and you are fated to be in a single class. Is this a reinforcing um, meme? Yeah, in it's India? a very tricky question, and I guess different people might respond to uh, this question very differently. Uh, Gita, for example, I mean, let's take at least one foundational text in order to describe the philosophy of Hinduism. Uh, if you take Gita, Gita gives emphasis for human action, not for the genesis of human action from a particular class, a societal uh, uh, description or a name, you know, or not a category. So it gives importance to human action. It is by the human action you decide to which order of social hierarchy you belong to, and not necessarily by the origin of your birth, where you are born, or which family you are born. But it is the nature of your human action which will decide which, uh, in, in, in the sense what you asked me, uh, in which hierarchical order you will belong. So it is... Uh, it is human action which is very important. It's very clear according to the Gita. So it doesn't promulgate a social division based on where you are born by your birth, but it classifies uh, your personality and your capability depending upon the, the action which you will roll out, the nature of your action which you will roll out, which again, uh, uh, you know, as I said, the, the idea of human action is very clear at the same time complex, according to the Gita. And uh, there's a lot of interesting cognitive approaches we can take for understanding human action. And uh, it's also said that, that the human action, action liberates you as well, as well as it can bind you. So it is both a liberative force and as a binding force. So for that, we, we can understand that binding, perhaps binding to the, uh, the societal uh, uh, framework and uh, the order in which you live, but liberate you to a particular transcendental uh, understanding of a transcendental self, which is beyond class, caste, and divisions. I see. That, that's, that's very good that, that it's action-based. That So does this mean that um, the philosophy has a certain equality amongst humans, or it, it poses that all humans start out with equal opportunities, uh, or is there a hierarchy amongst human stations that you can get from your previous karma? What, how, what do people aspire to be reincarnated as? Is there a particular top <laughs> that you're looking yeah. to achieve? Yeah, again, maybe there could be different versions, but as uh, I, I would understand, and uh, from perhaps more, uh, uh, I guess, a more popular understanding of the Gita, or perhaps an Advaita Vedanta interpretation of Gita, uh, everybody has equal opportunity, and everybody, in the sense, any species, any form has equal opportunity. So it is not that you are privileged. To be in a particular species in order to be, uh, you know, and just uh, to to realize your true nature, and uh, in 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 the epic, as well as in different story forms, this is said again and again. The stone can suddenly, a stone can suddenly realize its true nature 
So not necessarily you have to be form, uh, you have to be born as a human form, but then there are also certain discussions in other texts, not in the Gita, that it is good to be born in uh, in, a, in the in in the as a human individual because perhaps your capacity to think may be more there, <laughs> but not necessarily. I think the human form is given as a privilege or as a supremacy over other species or other non-human forms. Interesting. So tying it back then to, to um, biology, bringing in your, your, your second degree, um, what do you see as parallels between the uh, Indian philosophy and uh, the, the work in neurobiology? Are there any particular striking parallels that you see in, uh, between the two fields? Well, I think uh, a couple of ideas which are very interesting in neurophilosophy is the uh, the availability of different concepts to understand the nature of human self. And it begins with uh, understanding certain capabilities which are cognitively driven, certain capabilities which are emotively driven. And uh, in today, I think there's also a discussion on uh, what they call as neurotheology or neurophenomenology and uh, so on and so forth, which gives, uh, and again, neuroethics, which is very important. So bioethics, these are all sub-disciplines, which means uh, what we call as values, what we call as personal values or larger metaphysical values. These all get a place when we discuss consciousness. So, so neuroscience, uh, otherwise, which is a very strictly biological discipline, will also have to give room to understand some of these concepts, which are not just uh, biologically driven, but also culturally nourished and enriched as we live our life. So the historicity of the human self in the form of its cultural past and cultural present, I think is better accommodated by neuroscience today than perhaps mm. uh, in the past. And tying the ideas of, of the philosophy to the biology and to the, and to, even to the physics, um, are these um, aspects of, of Indian thought um, ne necessarily supernatural or are, or do you believe that these are uh, natural things that we are are going to be able to to discern through uh, studying the brain and studying um, biology? How do these things fall in your in your thinking? So, uh, you know, I think in Indian philosophy as a whole, the division is not between something which is mystical or supernatural as you have described it, and something which is earthly or worldly. Uh, the idea is of the coexistence of uh, multiple kinds of beings and multiple possibilities of life. But that doesn't mean that there is a world which is supernatural and there is another world which is more naturalistic. Uh, but there are multiple worlds. There are plural worlds, not just two worlds. And we don't understand these many different kinds of worlds. And there are diff descriptions actually for different kinds of planetary existence uh, in some other texts, uh, both above and below. <laughs> but I think another time we can discuss that. And uh, so uh, uh, so I, I would think that it is a metaphysics which is more predominant than uh, an idea of something which is supernatural. Because if once we discuss about what is supernatural, then it goes into more of a populist understanding of uh, existence and, uh, you know, all kinds of beings, which we are familiar from our religions and our childhood, et cetera, et cetera. But here, I think uh, the inclusion is of mysticism in the sense of accepting the coexistence of many different life forms. And at the same time, Every life is as important, equally important as every other life. This entire subject is uh, ties my brain in knots, uh, <laughs> uh, but that's that's a, I think a very good um, 
a good idea to to keep with us is that that there is there's an equivalence of life and and we should respect other life forms i think that's a a very good message uh to to leave people with um so we're getting towards the end of our our time slot is there anything else that you'd like to uh express to us to maybe help us understand the, the 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 philosophy and the thought of self in in this in in this thinking and and how this all comes together and I mean, what, what maybe express your beliefs in this or your, your understanding. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Scott, uh, for those important uh, references. Uh, I think we also have to consider the current life world, which we are living in, which is gripped by a pandemic and uh, our inability to understand how a microorganism uh, as uh, dominated our everyday life. So, uh, so we don't have answers, right? I mean, uh, the pandemic world is looking for ans- larger answers. And this is also the time where we can cope with the challenges that life brings in by reminding us that coexistence is very important. Coexistence with other beings, be it be a microbial existence, or maybe another species, we don't know about it. So I think the most important aspect which comes uh, in the context of understanding consciousness within the pandemic world is the, uh, the, the relevance of coexistence and how coexistence has to be understood as something which is promoted by the idea of oneness, which again is founded uh, on the metaphysical principles of consciousness. And I think this also is important to understand the self as something which is much more inclusive than a binary idea, which goes back to a Cartesian, Baconian, uh, you know, consideration of uh, mind matter or matter life, et cetera, and et cetera. But as something which is non-dual, inclusive, multi, ma, ma, uh, in a sense, uh, plural. And the pluralistic nature giving the enrichment and uh, the beauty each self holds. So if we talk about the self, I think it's very important that we consider coexistence and uh, the integral existence of all beings and how consciousness serves as the larger metaphysical principle to understand that it has the larger beholder of things and beings. Because we need a particular metaphysical idea to understand how multiplicity is held uh, in, a, in a seamless manner. And the only principle which we can take is consciousness, not just as a cognitive ability, but as something which is deeply metaphysical, deeply phenomenological. In a sense, it's experiential. And also something which gives you a life purpose and which is beyond the world which you are currently used to, or the cognitive frameworks which we are currently used to. So it gives you a larger purpose, a larger, a deeper, and a higher direction, and uh, perhaps to explore your own self, and perhaps where no one has gone before, and that self-inquiry, which is something which is deeper and in, inner, which is largely private. But I guess the meeting point is not going to be private. That is going to be uh, very uh, enriched in the sense of existing of a plurality in a seamless manner in consciousness. Well, okay. Well, thank you for broadening my mind on this. Um, this has been a very, uh, very uh, enlightening conversation. I, I have a much better uh, appreciation for, for Indian thought on, on this matter. So thank you for that. You've, you've used a few metaphors in your discussion um, that I see as parallels with science fiction. You, you have where no one has gone before, <laughs> and we also have this, this where everything is one in the force kind of thinking in terms of panpsychism. Yeah, just, just to interrupt you, yeah, Star Trek itself is inspired by that final frontier of space. So the inner space is is also a final frontier, yeah. So, 
yeah, it's it's uh, uh, perhaps not science fiction, but I would say that uh, is the ability to perhaps imagine our existence in a very different manner, which I think is very socially relevant as well. And uh, by the way, I'm very interested in also in ideas of artificial intelligence and uh, non-human existence in the sense of uh, how would you re define a robotic existence, an android existence. This is also very, very important because these are semi-human existence. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt you because I think I just remembered Star Trek and its uh, first line, you know, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the final front. That, no, that's that's also very interesting, and I've also explored uh, artificial intelligence in, in the podcast, and you know, thinking about um, can artificial intelligences have sentience, have internal experiences, and from from your point of view, from your thinking, from this philosophy, it seems like there's no obstacle for that to occur. Would, would that be correct? That artificial intelligences uh, could be sentient. No, uh, Again, you know, in the sense, again, we have to understand artificial intelligence in what sense, because even in what we are doing now, there is certain elements of artificial intelligence involved, right? I mean, basically, uh, because it has become the part of our everyday life with the Internet of Things and uh, decentralized uh, way of uh, using services and so on. But I think the fundamental question of the self comes in artificial intelligence in the context of that a non-human entity can have a self? That, I think, is a very important question. But what are the fundamental uh, characteristics which is needed in order for something to be called as a self? So, again, I think you will be aware that uh, self-awareness is considered to be a very important aspect to be considered as a self. The ability to reflect, the ability to detach from your experiential self to look at yourself and to see something deeper and higher, perhaps qualifies you to be a self. And uh, this is again contentious, but I think this is one of the uh, million dollar questions in artificial intelligence to understand. Do you need to have a self in order to perform what the human being is able to perform in its everyday life, in her or his everyday life? So there are two parties. One party would believe that yes, there need to be a self because of the ability of an individual, human individual, to imagine beyond its capacities, capabilities, the nature of its current self itself, which it, some people believe a self of an artificial intelligent self will not be able to do. Yes, that, that is the million dollar question. So yeah, the, that's definitely worth uh, a lot of exploration, maybe another podcast. Uh, <laughs> So I think I'm going to leave it here. Thank you so much for, for coming on The Rational View, uh, Dr. Menon. I'll, I'd like to send you a, a Rational View t-shirt if you'd like, uh, and so that you can uh, remember your experience here. Uh, I really appreciate you coming on and chatting with us. Thank you so much, Dr. Scott. It was a pleasure having a conversation with you for your patience. And to, to interview someone from India, because I don't see uh, another Indian in your podcast yet, uh, unless I'm wrong. So thank you for your interest in Indian philosophy, also your interest in consciousness. And I see that you are making a couple of episodes on consciousness. So, so I think it's really nice uh, having this conversation with you. And uh, I also really like that uh, title uh, and the rational part in it, because finally, I think it's very important that we bring in rational structures to even understand something which is uh, perhaps beyond the rational capacities. And I think the, ra the rational element in each one of us has that edge to go beyond its by itself. Mm, thank you very much for those closing thoughts. Thank you so much. Thank you. If you'd like to follow up with more in-depth discussions, please come find us on Facebook at The Rational View and join our discussion group. If you like what you're hearing, please consider visiting my Patreon page at patreon.podbean.com slash The Rational View. Thanks for listening.